Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Welcome to my session about Prediction I.O. for estimating dropout rates at universities. It's fantastic to have you all of you here. It's the first day at Dreamforce. Uh, the party just started, so yeah, let's do it. So I'll introduce myself a little bit. I'm Luciano Estraga, a 26 Salesforce certified professional from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Uh, I work for Santex. At, at Santex, we are so passionate about what we do, and probably this session is a proof of that. Uh, I also collaborate with the University of Palermo in Argentina, Buenos Aires, as teaching Python for a specific subject, and that was actually the motivation of this research I did. Um, we have an agenda for today. Probably, while building this session, uh, the main challenge was to find a good balance between a super technical session and something that could be useful uh, and understandable for everyone. So yeah, this is what we have. We, have a, are, we are going to introduce the topic and which was the motivation behind this. Um, we are going to start from simpler to complex uh, while introducing some machine learning concepts. We are going to have a demo and finally, of course, the session resources and some Q&A. So let's start this trail. We are at trailhead. <laughs> Prediction I.O. for the academic world. What is this? OK, so I'm, as I mentioned, I'm part of University of Palermo in Argentina, Buenos Aires. Um, we have a, a subject, which is programming fundamentals. Just to check the audience, how many of you do something related with coding or that coding is your everyday task? So yeah, many hands. So you are, most of you are developers, right? And very basic programming structures like if and else statements, while for loops are your basic tools every day. But probably for people that it's not used to work or that it's not used to code and ju they're just learning, they're just starting, and if they don't have a previous experience, coding might be a nightmare. So we detected a specific course, which is Programming Fundamentals, in which we teach students how to code, uh, that they were leaving the courses after sitting for the first exam. So we detected that, that's a concern for us. And I propose university to implement something different, something new. I heard about Prediction I.O. last year, uh, right here at Dreamforce, and really took my attention. Uh, so I proposed the university to, to try to implement Prediction I.O. for estimating how many students will pass or not an exam, how to build courses in advance, so build it in a, in a smarter way, how to group people based on or inferring first if they're going to pass or not an exam. And at the end of the day, what we were trying to do, because this is a pilot program that the University of Lermo is implementing right now and needs evaluating uh, in conjunction with Salesforce, to build something that could be scalable and not just only applicable for just only dropout rates. So make something that could be uh, useful in other areas. So the solution we have for today it's composed by Salesforce because we are, we are, I mean, we are Dreamforce and we have the full stack available for us. So we will use everything but the pilot that we already created. It's quite limited. We are using Salesforce SubCloud, of course. We are using a, a prediction IO that it's bundled with Apache Spark. So the one, are, are here people working with big, big data? Raise your hand if it's someone of you working with beta. Okay, perfect. Many hands. That's fantastic. So we are going to use Prediction I.O. with Apache Spark. We are also going to use Scikit-Learn, which is a Python library, uh, a machine learning Python library, which is incredible if, if you're not familiar with machine learning. And so if you're just starting, Scikit-Learn is super easy, has a lot of examples. It's fantastic. And of course, for delivering the, the, the storage of the, of the models, the predictive models and events and that, we are going to use Heroku. So by the way, Unlike in other sessions in which you need to wait, you need to wait to you need, you need to wait to, to, till the end to see something working, I would like to catch your attention for the first time, and I would like to jump directly to Salesforce to see something working, so you don't need to wait till the end. So we are in Salesforce Lightning Experience. By the way, as a Salesforce developer and as a consultant, I'm so happy to announce that this year with Winter 18. Lightning Experience is working faster than Salesforce Classic. So if you didn't uh, switch yet, I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity here at Dreamforce. So we have a list of students. Actually, students are contacts in Salesforce. And perhaps we can choose Marina Galvan, which is right here. 
And we know a couple of things about Marina Galvan, that he coded at high, he coded at high school, so he has a previous experience. He liked coding, and he had an excellent performance at high school in mathematics. So um, we can ask Predictionary, oh, if this student will pass. We have a, this is lightning experience, we have a lightning action working with a lightning component that is making a call behind the scenes to Predictionary. I will explain that later. But we can ask if, predict, if Marina uh, will pass. Yes, in this case, he will pass. Of course, it's obvious, because he liked coding. But what would happen? Uh, if he didn't like. So, yeah, he did not code at high school and he don't, she doesn't like coding. So, in this case, we'll fail. That's obvious. Okay, and that's, imagine how amazing it could be to predict if a student will pass or not an exam. But going even forward, we can use some out-of-the-box functionality of Salesforce, which is a Salesforce Kanban. We, if you didn't try it, it's time to do it. So we have the same list of students, and we switch to the Salesforce Kanban. So now you have three courses, depending on the day, and since you already know if a student will pass or not an exam, you could put Marina Galvan with other students that you will know that will pass so as they can help her, you can move it from one place to the other. So, I mean, it's pretty convenient, and this is functionality out of the box in Salesforce, apart from prediction I.O. So, that is just something to, to, to show you, uh, to have an idea about how to implement this with Salesforce. So, let's we define some machine learning concepts be before. So, so, these three words, you, you log on Twitter and you will see a lot of about this, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, what is this? Okay, in my opinion, artificial intelligence is the, the natural evolution of programming in which you're not as tied to the static if and else statement. So, the behavior of your system could be enhanced. So, it's the idea to, to make computers to mimic human behavior, right? Uh, with machine learning, we have Within artificial intelligence, sorry, we have machine learning, which is a subset of, art, of artificial intelligence, in which the idea is to understand that algorithms, models, systems could perform better as long as they learn. So the more you, you the lear, learn, the more you, you perform better, right? And finally, deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning in which you focus on represent knowledge. Neural networks is an example of that. We are today focusing on machine learning, but these are three concepts that we need to introduce before. Again, within machine learning, we have like two, two worlds, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. To be super simple and clear with you, if I tell you that something is orange and it's a vegetable, you will infer that it's a carrot, right? And if I tell you that it's a, a red, and also it's a vegetable, maybe a tomato, right? Okay, we are giving the algorithm some initial examples so as to can uh, work. So supervised learning is the concept in which you feed, you train algorithms initially to help them to make a decision. So, and with this uh, algorithm, when they are learning afterwards, they are going to be able to make better decisions. And we're in machine learning world, there are features and labels. So features are the attributes, so you know that it's a fruit and it's uh, orange, you know that it's a, a vegetable and it's red, these are the features. And the expected outcome, that it's a carrot, will be the label. So this is a very basic terminology about machine learning. We need to others. Okay, why prediction I.O.? Prediction I.O. was acquired by Salesforce a couple of years ago and donated to the Apache Software Foundation and now it's a formal project within um, Apache Software Foundation. That's a, that is super important because a couple of weeks ago was um, designated as a formal project. Was pre previously, it was an incubator project. So, and that, that it means that the, the impact on the market will be important in the following years. So, why prediction I.O.? Prediction I.O., if I had to define prediction I.O., it's a very convenient place to start working especially if you're not a data scientist, because you have available a bunch of templates in which the only thing you need to do is to modify to your needs, to the problem you need to solve, right? 
and these templates are on Scala. You don't need to be a Scala developer. In a couple of weeks, you just understand the syntax of the language and you modify to your needs. So another person make the effort to create these pre-built templates that address different issues. Um, it's available for you with Prediction I.O. Apart from that, it's super easy to consume. So we are publishing to the rest of the world with REST APIs um, a predictive model that could be consumed by anywhere. So you can train those algorithms by REST API and also you can make predictions in real time with the same um, protocol, which is REST APIs. Finally, if you are working with big data, tons of gigabits or whatever, uh, Prediction IO is ready to handle that because it's built on Apache Spark. So it's absolutely ready if you come from a Hadoop environment or Cassandra or any other distributed uh, file system. I mean, it will be compatible with that, so you don't need to be able to make a, a, a huge transformation and you'll be implementing map reduce uh, algorithms. So apart from that, Apache Spark has machine learning library, which is the library that most of the templates that are available to download uh, are written with. So this is basically to have an idea. Which is the first challenge of making machine learning? Well, choose which is the algorithm that it's useful for your problem. And this is definitely not easy. Perhaps this slide, it's actually the most useful within the whole presentation. We are not going to follow it in detail, of course, but basically it tells you if the, the, how many data you have, uh, if you have to go for a regression or, or a classification problem. I mean, following this, if you are just starting with a machine learning, we could help you a lot. Which is the second step to build a model. So with, for the university, we did an, an initial survey of about 104 observations. And the features that were keeping in mind was sex, career, how was the mathematics performance at high school, if they got coded or not, uh, if they code at work, and how many times they course that specific subject with these programming fundamentals. So we had seven features, seven codified variables. We assign a code for each one. Not all the algorithms are capable to handle categorical variables, so you need to make a transformation and assign a code uh, for them. And we decided to use naive Bayes algorithm. So it's a very famous uh, algorithm within machine learning, which uh, we have chosen this algorithm for many reasons. First of all, because have uh, small data, just only 100 examples. So and naive Bayes performs great with small data. It is easy to implement and understand the fundamentals behind this are basic statistics and mathematics. So you can learn uh, and you understand what's doing the algorithm, how is the behavior, and it's of course supervised learning. That means that we need to train that algorithm initially, and we made uh, 104 observations to train it. Finally, evaluating the model. How do we know if the model that we created is accurate? There are many techniques for doing this. Uh, what we did is cross-validation. Cross-validation is a technique in which you take your whole data set, in this case was 104 observations, and you split it in an 80 and a 20, and you train initially your model with the, the 80%, and with the other 20, that in which you know which are the expected labels, the predictive values that we want to know, you test it with that, and you compare, okay, with this uh, data, it performed well or not. And we obtained with 10 random split, which we use Apache Spark for this, uh, we obtain an 81% of accuracy, which is pretty good for just only 100 observations. Okay, it's time to demo, right? It's time to see how this works behind the scenes. So, as I mentioned, when you work with Prediction IO, you go to the website and you could download any of the available templates that you have and are divided uh, based on which is the problem you want to address, if it is a recommend, uh, recommendation problem, a classification, classing, k-means is implemented in Prediction I.O., by the way. So when you decide to choose, and when you know which is the algorithm that you'll be using, you just need to clone the Scala project. All of the Scala project has the following structure. So you, you have a project with basically three important source files, which is data source, 
the engine, the algorithm itself, and a couple of ones for evaluating accuracy. So basically, you don't need to be an Scala developer. You'll be modifying, which is the variables, actually the features, talking in machine learning terminology. So we had seven features for our use case. We can review them so as to. So we know that the first attribute was the sex, uh, how was the performance at, at mathematics at high school, if they like coding or not. I mean, all of the variables has uh, an order and a category. And our data set looks like this. So at the left, we have the expected labels, and at the right, with the other variables. So for the first one, we know that a zero is that will pass, and, and one that is, is going to fail. All of the templates, or most of them, comes with a Python script to, to import the data in the algorithm. And you'll be working mainly in data source, which is the, the uh, algorithm that may, takes the responsibility of feeding your model to training. It is working behind the scenes with Apache Spark, so it's ready to handle a lot of data. Right? Uh, the engine in which you declare which are how it's going to be the queries that will be made uh, with the event server uh, and when you make a predictive query. So basically, you are uh, telling how it's going to be the query. You're going to make a query with a REST client. I, sh I will show you that later. Um, the name based algorithm, that's the algorithm that you are importing from machine learning library from Apache Spark. I mean, it may, so may sound scary, but when you download it and, and the syntax is easy. I'm not a Scala developer, actually. So you can do it. It's simple to you. I mean, the, the challenge are to, to identify which is the algorithm that will help you, not just modifying a template, right? So uh, imagine that we already modify our template based uh, on our needs. So the first thing I'm going to do, when you create a, um, an application on prediction IO, you obtain an ID, right? And we have PIO app list will tell that we have one application, which is UPN IE base with this ID. All of the, all of the prediction IO applications has an ID. You can deploy more than one. So uh, first, Step, of course, it's to build the model. So we will run a PIO build. What it's doing this behind the scenes is to, it's compiling this Scala project. And if everything is going well, it's going to compile correctly. Yeah, your engine is ready for training. So we are going to train the algorithm. How to do this? OK, we have an event server that is published on a port. So we can hit that uh, endpoint to, to train the algorithm. That is pretty easy. The first thing we need to do is to uh, launch the event server. So it's going to publish on 7070 localhost uh, the event server in which we are going to be able to load all of the, our initial data of 104 uh, observations to the algorithm. The event server is ready. So to verify that it is working and listening for events, we can call this URL, which is making a get request to this specific application. And we don't have events uh, loaded yet. So what we are going to do? We are going to run the Python script uh, included on the project to load events we have on the text uh, file. So yeah, 104 events are imported. So basically what, it, what it's making, this is to making a post request to the event server and loading the events, reading this file of 104 observations, right? I mean, it's pretty easy. OK, now our algorithm is capable to learn from that data that we already loaded on. Here, this example, is you see, uh, it's using Postgres. But you could be using HDFS, Hadoop, I mean, your implementation. You don't need to change it. It is easier for for with Postgres because it's part of, of AppCloud, Heroku Postgres. So we are familiar with Postgres, but 
I mean, this is meant for big data. So our um, algorithm is ready to, to train. We are going to run PIO train. And we'll be reading the database to create a model, a predictive model. Yeah, it may take some time. Seems that we'll succeed or not. Live demo is risky. <laughs> Training completed successfully. That's great. So our last step here is to deploy the predictive model uh, to be able to be used. So PIO deploy. It will be publishing in on a different uh, port, locally, of course, in this case. So we can we will be able to, to, to talk with it, with a REST client, to save time while this is publishing the, the model. We are going to start opening, by the way, the REST client. <coughs> so let's check. Engine deploying and running on 8,000. So what we're doing here is to make in a post with the body that we define, considering the, the features we, we are working on. And we are not passing a, an ID of application because we can publish and deploy many um, events, ma many prediction engines. And we obtain a one, which is with these features, the, the student will fail, but you can start playing with it and check the results. In this case, we'll pass. Attribute five, by the way, is the number of times a student uh, take that course. So if you, can, if you did it five times and you fail, probably you will never pass the, the, the course, unfortunately. Uh, and you could play with sex. Likely for both uh, women and, and men, both they pass the exam. Okay, going back to the slides again. How to implement prediction IO with self of well? There are many ways to do it. Here we are seeing three. Uh, you could do it as, as we show locally and probably publishing that port to the rest of the world if you want to, to make it standalone on your own LAN network. You could do it with Heroku and actually the implementation I showed you at the beginning uh, with the lightning component that was called in prediction IO. It's a, the same uh, project, the, scale, the same Scala project you, you, you saw. It's the same but implemented on Heroku. And not just only for making the callouts to make prediction, but also to feed the algorithm. It's useful to use Heroku with Heroku external objects and Heroku Connect. So you can take advantage of that, just map uh, a Postgres database with your Salesforce object, and it's a seamless integration, no code, and it's ready to go. And finally, if you want to be innovative, uh, you could implement platform events. So there are great sessions here at Dreamforce about platform events. You could, since you are using uh, Heroku, you will be creating a Scala app or, or any other app that could be listening for Heroku uh, to Salesforce events. So it's another way to, to, to feed your algorithm, to make them talk, to communicate. So there are many ways, and so you just need to be creative with this. Finally, evaluating the data you have. This is perhaps more complex. I really recommend for this, if you are interested on, on, on check how your data looks like, because a model in prediction IO might be abstract, it's abstract so you don't know actually how, how it is, it's a black box. You could use scikit-learn, which is a machine, super famous machine learning library written in Python, super easy, much easier than, um, than Scala uh, and, and even the machine learning library provided by Apache Spark. And you could do something like this, which is drawing the decision boundary calculation. So our data with the 104 observations look like this. And all of the, and we obtain 
an 81% of accuracy. So if you look at the points that are blue, we're in the blue area, means that they're predicted correctly, right? And the ones that are blue on the red area are the ones that are incorrect. Same happens for the reds on the, on the blue area. So this will, I mean, it, it's like a, a, a picture about your data. It's interesting to have it so as to be more confident in which what you're doing. Also, for this example, we had um, seven features. But on real application, you, will have, you may have 100 features, variables. So in that case, you might be able to, to, to make a transformation to that. And that is when you come up with dimensionality reduction. It's a more complex scenario. There are some techniques. These are three uh, um, algorithms for making dimensionality reduction. You know that this is complex, and it's not the core of the, of the session. But if you leave the session by knowing something new, for my goal is accomplished. So it is PCA, LD, TNSE. Basically, what it takes your features and makes a transformation so as to reduce. And believe it or not, at the end, you may probably enhance your accuracy by transforming your by levels in just only one or two. So. Um, I would like to run a final Python script to, to show you how can this help you. This is not prediction I.O., right, by the way. So I will. So in this case, I'm evaluating the sex of the students and also how many times they course it. We will start with the picture one. So um, zero was for men, one for women. What we know is that I'm focusing on this picture one. What we know is that women that course, they pass on their first attempt. And they used to fail on the second one. And the behavior is uh, on men, which they used to fail the, f the first time, the first attempt, they, they, they course it, but they used to pass the second one. We have just only a few points because points are overlap one or the other. So they are, believe it or not, there are 104 points, but most of them are concentrated on, on different areas. And that's the reason why uh, the color is not the same on everyone. And we confirm what we were guessing that if you course it, if you course more than three times, regardless of your sex, you will not pass the exam, right? And we have we are just evaluating two variables, but after running those algorithms, the strange algorithms like PCA, uh, your data will be transformed. So that's a rotation of the data, and your data set will look like this if you use TSNE. I mean, this is just to, to draw your data, to have a, a different perspective about what you are doing, not just only to use the algorithm and, and, and leave it that. So this way you can have an idea how your data look like. Why I'm showing all of this? Because was, um, I didn't mention yet, but this was my diploma thesis uh, at university. So it was a research of six months. And, I really, mo I really like to motivate you on doing this because you learn a lot, regardless if it's not the core of your work. I work as a self professional. I don't, I don't work as a data scientist, but the idea is to try to motivate you on doing different things. And that we know that it's ready and available for developers, not just you don't need to be uh, a genius or, or a mathematician or a data scientist. So these are the session resources, if you like to take pictures of this. There is, a pay, there is also the paper I wrote for, for this work, which was a six months uh, research. Uh, on the repo, you will also be able to find not just only the, the code of the, the template, but also the code of the Lightning component that talks with Heroku and Dan, if you're interested. It works with Lightning experience with the Lightning action. 
And some bullet points important to, to, to finish this and, and, and have something clear. So machine learning is trial and error. So there is no uh, tutorial for making machine learning. You be, it's, a, it's an iterative process. Prediction I.O. is super scalable. Again, it's ready for big data. It's not like another system that makes prediction and when you put real big data, uh, it struggles. No, definitely it's ready. Apache Spark, it's fantastic on that. Uh, templates are ready for developers. You don't need a data scientist again. And in, a, in some point, we are introducing prediction as a service because prediction I.O. it's ready to be consumed for really everyone here. So before the Q&A, uh, I would like to invite you to something we are doing, not in Argentina, but in Uruguay, which is Punta Dreaming, and the first Latin American Salesforce conference. Uh, we did it this year. I was speaking there with super talented people, uh, Salesforce gurus, so it was a pleasure for me. And if you are on the area in Uruguay, you'll be able to, to come. And it's an event that's really worth it. So yeah, that's it. We have time for questions, in case you have. Hi, how was it regarding to the uh, data set that you're using for training uh, your system? How often, for a production system, you train uh, the whole system? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and never applies for, I didn't mention that. You need to start from, from the local, and when you are ready, switch to Heroku. Heroku is offering right now build packs to make this uh, like a tutorial, but your application needs to be restarted every time that the model uh, has been trained again. So that is up to you. You will decide how many times you will relaunch your predictive system after certain uh, levels of, of how, how can I say it? I mean, if you know that after three months, for instance, you, you will grab new data to train your algorithm, well, it's time to relaunch your application. So your application will be an, uh, um, unavailable while you're training. So it's something that it's up to you, and you need to consider when you relaunch your predictive uh, system. But you cannot make it learn, and instant, in the, in immediately start making predictions enhanced by the fact that you make the algorithm uh, train it, and, and it, that it, you, you may be able to, to, to make better decisions or, or better uh, predictions. So yes, that, that's a good question. I don't know if, yeah, we have another one. Go, go ahead. Uh, you said that this is a, a trial and error sort of process. Uh, right. What are some of the bad ways you went down and, and mistakes you made along the way of, of figuring well, this out? Well, the first mistake might be to choose the wrong algorithm. So, yeah, uh, and that's the reason we have chosen naive base, uh, because we know that performs correctly with small data, but none of the algorithms perform well with small data. And there are a lot of other considerations that we, you need to, to, to have while choosing an algorithm, not just only the, the, the how many events you have, but also the quality of them, because you could have a, a, a ton of data that will be making bad predictions. So yeah, that, that's super important too. And it's trial and error, as I said. Do you have a framework for figuring out uh, how long it's going to take to train, or to know if your model will converge at all? Because um, sometimes you might just. I mean, just... It uh, how long? Will the, 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 the framework to, to train? I mean, it's related, of course, with how, how much data you have and how it is implemented. So if you're using Apache Spark on a distributed way, um, like Hadoop, for instance, that will be proportional to the time that the algorithm will be taking to train. But like in terms of business terms, sometimes we have to tell like ETA, like when will be ready. So how is there a framework decide to give like an ETA saying, okay, I'm going to spend this much time on it. And if it doesn't work, maybe choose a bit. Many hours. Okay. So, or, or even I'm not just day, but many hours. Yes. Okay. So it could be a, a, a long process. That's the, that's the reason you need to uh, decide when do you need to, to implement this and way to retrain the model. 
could be a batch process at night, right? But, um, do you have ways in which you can pull out feedback from the, the variables you're feeding in, figuring out what, what different strengths there are, and then do you have any strategies on how you may be using that data or other data that you can figure out what the next point you should start feeding in, figuring out what are, what are going to be the most successful points? What do you mean by moving? feedback, sorry? So like, let's say you, 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 you feed your system, um, you train it, you find out, okay, these particular metrics are, are more predictive than the other variables. I see, oh, degree is, is, is yeah. a pretty strong predictor. Yeah, and Let this me start is also tracking. try and error, to analyze your data and try to discard wrong uh, observations or, or observations that are not uh, significant to the whole prediction. That is one of the reasons you also make dimensionality reduction. Yeah. Um, because, and most of the time when you make dimensionality reduction, you obtain better results. Thanks. And, and it's, I, I know that it's weird, but yes. Hi, so you mentioned there were three approaches. One was to build an in-house server, one was to use um, uh, Heroku and, and Apache Spark and all of that. And the third way was to use platform, platform events. events. Correct. Where would be the right place to start at looking into building a platform event based solution? I mean, the idea of, by, of using platform events is that Salesforce will be creating those events to feed the algorithm. The application on Heroku or whatever other place will be listening for those events and they will be hitting the event server on Prediction IO, and after that you will be training. But the idea is that Salesforce will be creating the events and the other application. There is a super easy way to, to integrate with platform events, which is JS Force, uh, in which you are listening for platform events or, or uh, topics. I mean, platform events is the evolution of, of streaming API, right? But thank you. Thank you. Um. So this application is taking the place of like a data scientist or someone who would do this manually. We could also have someone predicting. Um, is there anything that would throw it for a loop? Like if there were strong relationships between the features or is there any well, sort of thing that it doesn't do as well with? I mean, that it's part of the decision of which algorithm you need to choose. We decide to use naive base because the features, there's no a, a correlation between the features and it's one of the, the, the reasons you, you have to, to keep in mind while choosing an algorithm. In this case, features are not related between them, so sex initially and apparently has nothing to do with the times you course um, on if you like coding or not. So naive base works correctly with variables that are independent. But for variables that are dependent, there are another algorithms, and also you might be start evaluating of making a dimensionality reduction. So, so as to make, I mean, you not just only, when, when you make dimensionality reduction, you don't just need to reduce your dimension, but also to make a transformation that will, your algorithm perform better. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two minutes more. If someone wants to ask something. When is Punta Dreaming? Great question. Uh, at March. I know you uh, presented a slick uh, cheat sheet, right, for the algorithms that was great resource. Yes. Right? <clears throat> yes. But um, back to that. in general, right, when you're new to AI, you know, I come from computer science background, but my perception is that you have to learn so much. But, you know, you mentioned that um, AI is ready for you, even though you're not a data scientist, right? Correct. So are there any uh, other resources where you could go to and figure out what algorithms would suit your problem space and if people have found enough success using for that problem space that Yeah, sort most of, of the algorithm? templates uh, has reviews of people that has been used. And it's a community that is growing. So that's one of the reasons that this was an incubator project and now it's a formal project with the Apache Software Foundation. And we expect more templates and even if you had success with one template that you created, you could submit it. So, but yeah, there are reviews on, on how this w was implemented to formal projects and not just only a pilot that, okay. like this. So those are the developer forms in Apache yeah. AI? Okay. Yeah, Thanks yeah. yeah. All, right. All right. So are the templates the base for any of the Einstein work that's going on? Prediction IO is part of Salesforce Einstein. It's promoted, but it's not related closely. So there is no a, a close relationship, technically talking, 
uh, within Salesforce, uh, between Salesforce Einstein and Prediction.io. But it's part of the, the, the ecosystem, right? And probably Salesforce people will be submitting those templates. Yeah. Okay, guys, very thanks for coming. I really appreciate it.